right. Hello, Oslo. Woo! I'm absolutely thrilled to be here, guys. My name's Kylie Hunt, and I'm here to take you from crappy to happy. So thank you for coming. What we're going to do today is unpack four of the most common challenges that we face in the workplace today. They include dealing with a bad boss, shifting to a better work-life balance, dealing with unfairness, and embracing workplace change. Now, before we get started today, I'd love to know a little bit about you guys. So, hands up if you manage people. All right, we've got maybe 5% of you manage people. Okay, next question I have for you is, you can choose one of three options. I would like to gauge the amount of crappiness in the room right now. Okay, so... First choice is, how many people are like Jeremy Clarkson? They love their job. They can't wait for a Monday morning. It's the best thing since sliced bread. I've got one person, two. Okay, we've got bleh, less than 10%. Okay. Um, these guys would potentially go to work without being paid, but we won't say anything about that. The next group of people just feel a bit <laughs> meh. Right? <laughs> They're probably not the most productive, but they get the job done eventually. They just kind of go in, do their stuff, and then go back home again. So how many of you are a bit meh? All right, so we're probably about 20% now. Oh, no, the amount of crappiness is going to be huge. Oh, no. <laughs> right. How many people are like the poor old garbage man who's having a really shitty day? Okay. All right. So this compares really interestingly to a global research study that Gallup did in 2013 for their Global State of the Workforce report. And the degree of happiness and crappiness in this room is probably it's a little bit skewed towards the, the crappiness side. So when they did this study, they found that 13% of global employees are the Jeremy Clarksons. They're happy. They love their job. Most of us, 63%, are meh. But what's scary is 24% are like the garbage man, right? So the unhappy people almost outnumber the happy people by two to one. Now, I don't know about you, but that scares me because people who are unhappy in their job are potentially hostile to their organisations and can undo the good work that the amazing happy people do. So, before we get started, really started, I just want to tell you a little bit about my story. Now, forgive me if I read this a little bit. I just don't want to get emotional. So, why should you listen to me? Because I've been there. Uh, I, a few years ago, from the outside, I had a perfect job. I was a director in my company. I'd been there for a really long time, so I was known and respected. I was part-time, which in the property industry, particularly for females, is extremely difficult uh, to sustain. And I was earning a really good salary. But I was miserable. I absolutely hated my job. And for those of you who were at my talk last year, um, you may be familiar with the term Smondays, which is the point in a Sunday afternoon when you feel really crappy because you know that Monday's around the corner. I was a bitch. My husband would attest to that. I'm glad he's not here now. Um, so at my lowest point, I ended up going to my doctor. And she prescribed some stress leave for me as well as some Valium. Now, to me, that obviously just resolves the symptoms rather than the problem, right? So, I um, needed to understand the problem. Now, throughout my career, I had, um, I'd been guided by my dad, and he helped me with my first resume. He cried when I told him I was made associate director. Well, he didn't cry when I told him I was pregnant, but that's okay. That was my dad, right? Um, and he instilled in me uh, the importance of legacy. But I didn't really know that that was one of the values, other than work ethic and things like that, that he'd instilled in me until he died five years ago from cancer. 
And I was 12 weeks pregnant at his funeral. My dad dying taught me a really valuable lesson. And that is, what, would, what legacy would I be leaving my kids? That I was grumpy every time I was going to work, that mummy was sad, that mummy was upset on weekends, particularly Sunday afternoons. So I really, and what does that teach my kids when they're of the age, when they start to enter the workforce? That work is something to be endured rather than something that we can love and be passionate about and give our whole self to. So we've got to be happy. And needless to say, I left that job um, and I have reinvented myself as a workplace happiness guru because what a freaking awesome title that is. And the reason I'm sharing this is because, yes, I was crappy and it was up to me to turn that into something happy. So today, I'm here to share with you some of the strategies and the experiences and the tools that, that I've learnt um, and used myself over the years, but it really is up to you guys to do something with that. So I can lead a horse to water, but I can't make you drink, but I will be there, you know, kicking you up the butt if need be. So let's get on to how we can do this. <laughs> That's not my kid, but it's pretty awesome. So, right, the first crappy to happy issue is dealing with a bad boss. Now, it was interesting that only a handful of you guys actually manage people, so I would bet that the vast majority of you have had a bad boss or have witnessed a bad boss. Now, when I'm talking about a bad boss, I'm talking about the kind of person that makes you feel belittled, that makes you feel unappreciated, that makes you feel crappy. And this is persistent behaviour. So we can all be assholes occasionally, you know, we have a bad day. Um, but I'm talking about a persistent pattern of behaviour here when I'm talking about bad bosses. Now, picking the right boss is just as important, if not more important, it's finding the right job. Now, managers can change our work situation for the better or the worse. So they can give us really great projects or really shitty projects. They can hire us, fire us, bless you. They can um, let us go on holidays or say, no, you can't do that yet. So a bad, if you had a bad manager, it's really bad because there's, there's this power imbalance. They have this power over you. And this is why having a good relationship with your manager is just so important. But the good news is you are not powerless. You don't need to accept a bad boss, and quite the opposite. Because if your boss is not treating you right, you've got the responsibility to do something about it. I had an asshole boss. Um, he was a passive-aggressive micromanager. And let's just say we didn't really get along particularly well. Now, I tried all sorts of tools and techniques that I'm going to explain today, but nevertheless, there was just this imbalance, right? We just didn't get along. When I decided to leave my job, the head of HR interviewed me as part of the exit strategy, and he said to me, um, so would you recommend your friend works with this boss? And I said, yes, if they can handle that kind of personality. Now, for some people, a passive-aggressive micromanager is not a problem at all. My husband would love it. He'd see it as a challenge. But for me, it was... Do you know who my husband... Yeah. Troy Hunt. Uh, for me, it was the worst possible relationship that I could have, the worst possible dynamic. So that's why it's really important that we understand that it's, it's vital that we have the right compat compatibility with our bosses. Now, when we do have a bad boss, it can be absolutely tragic because it can take nearly two years to get over a bad boss. So if you think day after day, week after week, month after month, you're being belittled and put down and all sorts of things, it's going to have an effect on you. And it does. People who are bullied at work or have a really bad manager, they are more prone to stress, anxiety, depression, and then we get into the fun stuff of heart attacks and strokes. 
So if you have a bad boss, the effects are cumulative as well. Because if you start feeling like crap, you're not really going to want to put in 110%. You're going to start to become the garbage man, right? Which is going to start affecting your pay rises and promotions and things like that. So it is a cumulative effect. Now, there, what we need to do is understand why bosses are bad. And there are generally three types of bad bosses. There's the boss that doesn't know they're bad, right? Thankfully, this is the majority of bad bosses. They just don't know the effect that they have on you. I had one um, lady give me a call, young lady. She was just new in her career. Uh, she reached out to me on LinkedIn and she said, Kylie, I've started my career and I've got this new boss, but we just don't really get along. What can I do? And so I suggested to her that she note down the problems you know, so when your boss does X, it makes you feel Y, which results in Z, right? So we have some clear examples. Then take your boss out for a coffee and say that you'd like to discuss how you can work more productively together. Now, note we're taking it physically out of the workplace so that we can both be on an equal playing field because remember that power imbalance, right? We want to try and get on a level playing field as much as possible. Thankfully, that meeting went really well with Carolyn and she um, gave me a call back and said that she feel, felt so empowered to sit down and have a chat with this boss because this boss had no idea that he was making her feel like crap. They've now also got a strategy in place where they follow up every month. So I'm really pleased to hear about that. The second group of bad bosses are those who know they're bad and they want to improve. I've got a client of mine who is in IT and he runs his own company. He's got about 35 people um, in Australia and he knows he can be a bit of a, yeah, D-I-C-K. Um, and he reached out to me and said, I really need help with my onboarding process because it's a great process but no one's finishing it and I don't really know why. So I came in and had a look and we worked out that it wasn't necessarily about the onboarding process, it was about how it made people feel. So we had a look at his culture and um, we had interviews and it turns out that people actually didn't feel like he gave them any gratitude or acknowledgement. And so what he does now, which is absolutely awesome, is he writes little notes and even though, you know, one of them is a small one for Duncan for being a star, but the big one's for Steve-O because he's awesome. But it's these kinds of discussions that, that can really snowball into um, turning a workplace into something awesome. Now, the most dangerous one of all, you can see I had fun at Vigaland Park the other day, um, is the boss that doesn't give a shit either way. Now, these two, we can handle, right? This one, run. No matter what you do, you're going to be hitting your head against a brick wall mostly, right? These guys don't give a shit. So the tactics that I'm going to talk about today really revolve around these two, okay? So steps to managing a bad boss. As we've mentioned, assume no bad intentions. Your boss is not there trying to be an asshole, most likely, even though they are. They just don't know it. So they might be just unaware of their actions. Do it sooner rather than later. Do not wait for your boss to get a promotion or get posted overseas or resign or something like that. Remember that the effects on your health are cumulative. If you wait, you're only hurting yourself. Choose the right time to talk. So don't just grab them in the hallway or after a meeting. Set aside dedicated time and go out of the building to level the power imbalance in that playing field. Explain the effects on you and your work, just like Carolyn did. She said, when you do X, it makes me feel Y, which results in Z. And if Z can relate to actual business metrics, then you've got a better chance of your um, boss sitting up and taking notice. Make a plan and follow up. This is paramount, and I'm really pleased that Carolyn was able to do this because it's all well and good saying, yeah, 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 oh, I, I know, I know, and, you know, oh, I've been a bit of a dick and all of that. Um, you actually need to have a plan because then, as the employee, you feel that you've got more control over things, right? So if your boss is being a bit of a knob, um, you can say, hey, hang on a minute, we said that we were going to do it this way, and so it also helps them be more accountable. And finally, this is probably one of the most important elements. Now, Managers 
often don't receive praise because we feel that the praise should come from the top down, right? Let's try it from the bottom up and see what happens. I do that with my children and I'm not suggesting that bosses are like children, but (laughs) I'm going to stop there. So if they don't work, there's one more thing that might. There's proven medical benefits to just thinking about the idea of swearing at your boss. Okay? Now, swearing can be a fabulous source of pain relief. And it can actually jolt your brain into becoming more creative as well. (laughs) See? And you can change your thinking space. So what I'd like you to do is think about a really difficult person that, that you've worked with, right? And now... Imagine confronting them and in your mind, make sure it's in your mind, uh, and in the gentlest of tones telling them to go, do you feel any better? Because I certainly did. (laughs) So moving on to happy, um, crappy to happy issue number two, shifting to a work-life balance. Now, research shows that we're unhappier, more stressed and fatter than we've ever been. Now, This is a writer-downer, okay, if you have pen and paper. Uh, But this is an IT conference, so no. Uh, I'd like to say, we live in a world that celebrates work and activity, ignores renewal and recovery, and fails to recognise that both are necessary for high performance. Okay, so we need the work and activity, but we need the rest and recovery, so that when we're working, we're working at our optimal I just want to unpack this issue a little bit more. The umbilical cord to work is longer than it's ever been. There is this expectation now that we should be contactable virtually 24-7. So the blur between work and our our personal lives is certainly blurring even more. Um, And... Sorry the term work-life balance, is actually almost a little bit misleading because it implies that there's an, there's an um, an equal part. But it doesn't mean an equal balance, right? Because if you try and work the same amount of hours you work at work and then try and um, apply that to your personal life, it's, it's just never going to work out because life needs to be more fluid than that. So your best individual work, work-life balance, will vary over time as well. So if you're new in your career, it might be different to when you're nearing retirement. It'll be different when you're a single person versus married. It'll be different when you have children. So there's, uh, it will vary over time. And also, there's no perfect balance that you should be aiming for. So the best work-life balance is actually different for each of us because we all have different priorities and different lives. So let's think of work-life balance as work-life integration or work-life blend or work-life fill-in-the-blank. We've got this competing belief that people need to work long hours in order to be successful and do a good job. But it's absolutely crazy. 30 hours of working and still going strong, said this girl. She's 24 years old. Hours, just hours after posting this tweet, she collapsed, fell into a coma and died. From overwork, from exhaustion and a Thai energy drink. Like, holy moly. And just hours before that as well, she was, um, she was saying that she was, sorry, she was contemplating moving her bed into the office. And days before that, she was saying that she was really happy to get home before midnight. She was celebrating this. People were liking this and retweeting it and going, wow, wow. Now, this needs to be a wake-up call because I would like all of us to reject this cult that we have of overwork. Someone will say, oh, I didn't leave the office till 9 o'clock. Someone will go, oh, I didn't leave till 10. It's not a competition because long work hours, they erode our health. Right? We don't end up being able to have time to look after ourselves, get exercise, eat properly. So... And once again, the effects are cumulative, right? All these bad things happening to you, um, it gets worse over time. But how much work is too much work? Well, 39 hours apparently. And the Norwegians have got it right because on average they work about 30 hours a week. 
and they earn more money than people that work longer hours. Right? So there are people there that are earning, that, that are working 50, 60, 70 hours a week, and yet you gorgeous, awesome Norwegians have got it all sorted and are working 30 hours and have got a better work-life balance than a lot of other developed countries. So it's, it, this leads me to the first step in improving our work-life integration. I've seen firsthand that working less and relaxing more doesn't necessarily lead to happiness. Right? I've tried. The key is how we isn't how we divide our time between work and play, it's how we use, how we focus on the time when we're doing it. So, for example, most people's working time is pretty, pretty long, right? Eight hours a day. Are we always at our peak? No. We just kind of go, oh, I'm going to go get a coffee. Oh, I need to go get something. And then you might have, oh, sugar, I've got to get this work done for a meeting or something like that. So... Really, if we were to be as effective as we could be, we would be focusing much more on how we spend our time. We also need to value our productivity over extra hours. So, as I mentioned, it's, it's not a case of if you need to get more done, keep working, uh, because, you know, your productivity performance starts to decrease after about 39 hours a week. So, if you try and work extra hours, you'll probably have the effect of just being less productive. Ooh. Sorry, that, they were my earrings. Don't nod your head. I was just saying to someone the other day, now when you go and have a, do your presentation, don't wear dangly earrings. Do as I say, not as I do. Uh, right, now the next element is to unplug re regularly. Now, because this, the workday never seems to end, we need to make sure that we actually do shut off our phone. And when we're at our kids' soccer game, don't check your emails. If you're at a family function, turn off your phone. Be present. Now, we are very fortunate because we have Denise Jacobs in the house. Woo! Woo! Denise is the author of Banish Your Inner Critic, and I'm sure she will agree with me when I say that when you actually take your mind off work and have time to recover, you're, you become more creative. Right? Denise is nodding, so for those that, that can't see. Uh, so what I'd, I just want to make sure that the message gets through that we, we have to unplug. Please. The next element is chunking it down, having an hour of power. So if you focus on one task and then take a short break and then go and focus for another hour on another task, you will actually be more productive than having the, oh, I'm going to wander over and, and go and get a coffee type thing. Um, it means they're actually working smarter and not longer. Right? We can fit other things into the space in our lives. The next element is, of course, to reject this cult of overwork. Let's not be the copy, copywriter who boasted about um, working so hard. Sorry, guys. Uh, and let's change our attitude and just try and dispel this myth that we have to work long hours in order to do a good job. And the final element is probably the most important. Protect your mornings. Now, there's an awesome psychologist called Ron Friedman, and he said that the first three hours of your day are the most precious for maximised productivity. Because research shows the brain, specific, specifically the prefrontal cortex, is most active and readily creative straight after sleep. So when you're asleep, your subconscious mind has been loosely wandering around. And when you wake up, your mind is most active to do thoughtful work. I do want to go into this a little bit more because that's usually me in the morning, right? I understand that protecting your mornings won't work for everyone. Single parents and, and that, it's difficult. But we can try, right? We can try and do it in the context of our own lives. So, for example, my kids are allowed to watch TV on the weekend so long as it's after 6 o'clock. So at 6.01, I hear the pitter-patter of little feet going downstairs to watch Scooby-Doo. And that was me. But I've gone, no, I'm, I'm protecting my morning. And I got up and I worked a couple of hours on this presentation, just some solid work. And it, I was so productive. It was fantastic. Yes, I still do this on occasion. But when I actually 
uh, got out of bed and did some work, it was actually really, really fulfilling. So alternatively, you can wake up a few extra hours early and try and get some work done. But it's really just uh, trying to make something work for yourself. Now, the alternative is to do the 90-91 rule. So for 90 days, you spend the first 90 minutes of your day working on your number one priority. Now, I'm sure that this is not checking social media or your emails. What I want you to do is spend your mornings on output, not input. If you don't protect your mornings, a million other things will come up because they always do. So have some... Um, respect for your time and try and encourage your employees and your colleagues and, and your partners as well to give you the time that you need in the mornings. Right, crappy to happy issue number three, strategies to tackle unfairness. Now, we're going to try something here. I'm from Australia, obviously. So here I have some Tim Tams. One for you. No, not for you. One for you. Mm, one for you. No, not for you. There you go. One for you. Uh, here we go, guys. And here you go. This row can have some. There we go. And no, none for you guys. Uh, there you go. You can have all three. Woo. Uh, here you go. You're standing up. There you go. And one for you. Okay. I bet the people that didn't get a Tim Tam are probably hating me right now. Oh, yeah. What about these? Want some Vegemite? All right? Here you go. You guys are hating me even more now. Uh, Oh, you need some Vegemite. Absolutely. There you go. Uh, oh, you really want some, so no. No. There you go. Right. And you guys are at the back. Sorry, I should have given you Tim Tams instead of Vegemite. There you go. You can have three of them. Okay, now hands up. Who got Tim Tams? Who got more than one Tim Tam? Who got the Vegemite? I gave mine away. You gave yours away. Oh, nice. You don't like Vegemite, do you? <laughs> okay, hands up. Who didn't get anything? It's all right. I've got... There's method in the madness. Okay. Those who didn't receive anything, your um, amygdala is actually going beep, beep, beep in your brain. Okay? It's going, Kylie sucks. That's not fair. I don't like her. I'm going to give her a red card because I didn't get a Tim Tam. <laughs> to those people, I say, I have the rest of the box. Please make it green. Now, what I want to illustrate here is that fairness, it's not just a nice to have, it's a biological need. Okay, so the people that didn't get Tim Tams are there going, oh, Kylie, you suck. And now I know for next year that um, apparently dark Tim Tams and white chocolate Tim Tams are, are the go. So, you know, I'll work up to that, guys, okay? So, <laughs> unfairness is one of the most demotivating factors uh, we can have in the workplace. Now, whilst fairness in itself is not enough to make us unhappy, or happy, unfairness is enough to make us unhappy, right? So, it's not always easy to be fair. I was a bitch just then, saying, yeah, you can have one, but you can't, with no apparent reason whatsoever. Now, I was using my bias, and I didn't even know it. I just want to unpack this a little bit more. We receive 11 bits of information at any point in time when we're awake. 11 million pieces of information. But consciously, we can only process about 40 pieces of information at any one time. So, for example, if you are in the middle of your hometown and there's thousands of people everywhere, how do you pick your friend's face out of the crowd? You actually use your unconscious bias. Now, 
I will break this down a little bit. Malcolm Gladwell, in his book Blink, said that our unconscious attitudes might be entirely different to our conscious values. For example, we consciously know that it's absolutely absurd to pay people who are fatter less money. It happens. It's unfair, but it happens. We also know that it's unfair that women shouldn't get equal pay for equal work. We also know that it shouldn't be fair that people get paid different rates just because of the clothes that they wear. Yet it happens. Now, imagine this dynamic happening when you're recruiting people or speaking to your clients or customers or undergoing a performance evaluation or training people. So what are some strategies that we can use to tackle this unfairness? We need to recognise that we do all have unconscious bias. And because we all have it, there's nothing to be ashamed of. Now, Google have recognised this and they have this big workshop that they offer to everyone, um, not just people in Google, right? They've got this amazing workshop that's available online and it is called Unconscious Bias at Work, if you'd like some more information about it. Check it out. It's actually really, really interesting. And it's free. The next element is to step back from conclusions. It's important to remember that inju injustice is in the eye of the beholder. So it's critical that we are able to assess the situation accordingly. And there's no substitute for perspective. So wherever you can, if you feel you're being treated unfairly, have a chat to someone. Talk about it because it's likely that they will bring a different opinion or perspective. Let go of what you can't control. Now, you decide where you put your most precious resource, which is your energy. So you can choose to have an emotional reaction to something being unfair and me not giving out Tim Tams, or you can take a deep breath and choose how you would like to respond. And thank you for not killing me. Um, I certainly recognise unfairness uh, because I'm a mum of a four-year-old and a seven-year-old and I hear it in my house all the time. Mummy, that's not fair. Um, I was also made redundant when I was five months pregnant. Uh, so I really understand <laughs> what it's like to have this feeling of unfairness. When I was made redundant, uh, I, yeah, was upset. It was the first redundancy I'd ever had. Um, I took it to heart. But then I turned it around and 15 months later, the company hired me back again at a 42% pay rise. My pride has a price. <laughs> the next element here is to take the moral high ground. Now, sometimes it's actually okay to get on your high horse and stay there. Because if you just match grudge for grudge, where are you going, where's it going to get you? You're just going to expend your valuable resource, your energy. So if you are up on your high horse, you've actually got a really good vantage point from which to look down and look objectively at whatever your organisation or co-worker or something like that is doing. So take the high road because the view from, much, from there is much better anyway. Keep a record. I would bet that a lot of you have faced a situation where someone has taken ownership of an idea that you might have come up with. One way that we can counteract that is if we have this brilliant idea and we say, hey, guess what, I've just done such and such, and everyone goes, that's an awesome idea. You can then send an email after that meeting and say, hey, really glad you liked that idea about what I suggested to do X, Y, Z. Um, let's, let's continue to work on that and, you know, set out some frameworks or something like that. So if someone is there trying to take ownership for something that you came up with, you can just wave a little email in front of them and say, actually, it was my idea. And finally, reach out directly and privately. So pick up the phone and call them because there's no point wasting your emotions defending yourself to everyone else when you could just pick up the phone and talk to the person um, who treated you wrong. So start off the conversation by discussing your intentions. You don't need to justify what you did or defend it. 
just explain that you thought the other person might be misunderstood, might have misunderstood. If you need to apologise for not being clear, then do so, but don't waste your emotions on things that don't matter. Okay, crappy to happy issue number four. We love change so long as it doesn't happen to us. Now, change is one of the most common causes of stress in organisations and we know there are reasons why change happens, but does it kind of feel that change is happening more and more? It seems to be happening more and more quickly, I feel. And we've got a lot of uh, managers who are particularly bad at dealing with change um, because they don't realise that it is a process. Change is a process, it is not an isolated event and it takes time. Now, I know it's a graph, I'm sorry. Uh, there is actually um, a process that we go through. We go from shock to denial to frustration, depression, then we experiment with the situation, then we try and figure out how to work in the new situation and then finally we integrate it. Now, this is a really well-known uh, change curve and it was invented in the 1960s by um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. It's also known as the five stages of grief cycle. No wonder we don't like change. It's based on a grieving process. Now, the oldest and strongest emotion, well, we don't like change because of fear. This is, I find this a really interesting quote. This is an American... Uh, author who writes horror stories, so he would certainly know all about fear. But we know that change is inevitable and it's necessary for businesses to thrive and survive. So we need to overcome these fears, but how do we do it? We're scared of failure. We're, we're, we've got a fear of success, fear of looking stupid, a fear of the unknown. How we thrive is through predictability and having control. When there are changes, things are suddenly thrown into a state of uncertainty. Now, it's perfectly normal to feel a bit fearful, a bit confused or unsettled by changes that happen uh, at work at first. Okay, once again, it's a process that we go through. We're wired to respond to change and uncertainty because we're primed to be alert, right? But this can translate into anxiety. So what we need to recognise is that change isn't the, isn't the challenge, it's the transition. So some tips on embracing workplace change. First thing you need to do, acknowledge the change. I know that sounds really simple, but if we acknowledge it, it means that we can... Um, face it. It means that we can understand the impact that it has on us. It means that it's an actual thing. Now, I worked for this one boss and he promised me an awesome promotion if I did a particular project really well and we got it through council and all of that. And I worked my bum off because uh, I really, really wanted this promotion. And then all of a sudden, he left. He went overseas. Poof! There goes my hope of my next promotion. And I felt really bitter, because the person that came in had no idea that I had this discussion with my old boss. And so I could choose to get shitty, or I could choose to focus on the next goal. And so the next goal resulted in my son being born 12 months later. <laughs> the goals don't always have to be related to work. So, by setting a new goal, we can bring about this wonderful mind shift. So I went from, oh God, I'm, you know, my job and, and promotion and all of that to, I'm gonna have a baby. So <laughs> we can, um, and, and if you can imagine for a woman, it's a huge mindset shift, amazing mindset shift. Uh, the next element that we, can, that we can do to embrace workplace change is to talk about it. I had lots of lunches with girlfriends um, to discuss the challenges that I faced at work because there were times when I was scared for my job and clearly 
you know, one of those realities came through when I was made redundant. Um, but what I did was, by talking to my girlfriends, it, it helped give me a reality check and breaked, broke, the, breaked, broke the negative pattern in my head. So I needed to stay positive as well because fear can come from creating all these negative scenarios. Okay, we can, we can just build these things up into catastrophic um, and horrible things that we think are going to happen to us. But if we understand the transition and have realistic expectations, we are able to deal with it a lot better. For example, when we first jump into a swimming pool, sometimes it's really cold, right? But we stay in it because after a few minutes we get used to it. Think about change in that sense. If you understand that it's a process and that, yeah, it's going to be uncomfortable initially, but I'm going to get used to it and then I'm going to absolutely love it, then we're able to deal with things a lot better. And finally, get involved in the change. If you're helping to drive the change, then you will most likely be more understanding of the rationale behind it. Because often change, we feel that it's just from the top down. So to have a degree of control over the change itself is absolutely vital. And if we keep working and keep giving ourselves this sense of purpose and accomplishment, we'll be able to keep up our morale as well. And we know that, that change is the new constant in the workplace. We're all, um, we're all here in IT and here at the conference because things are moving so quickly and we want to stay up to date with what's going on. So you have taken the first step from crappy to happy by being here today. And as I mentioned in the beginning, it's now over to you guys to see what you do with that information. Because I've given you the kick in the butt. It's up to you guys to do something about it. Because without a clear purpose, the mind will wander often into a useless place. So don't let that place be crappy. Uh, I hope you learned something today. If you didn't, I have Tim Tams. If you did, I have Tim Tams. Um, I'm Kylie Hunt, and I would like to open the floor up to any questions that you might have. Anyone have any questions? I should have remembered this is Norway. <laughs> Has anyone been through similar situations before? Yes, sir. <laughs> So I'm going to pick on you now then. No, <laughs> yes, Denise. So Denise had, sorry if I can just, Denise had a boss who um, made her come in at before nine o'clock each morning and no one else in her team did uh, need to do that and she would often send her boss home to his pregnant wife at seven o'clock at night and she would obviously still be there. It was an awful situation, and so, you got out. And I got out, and it's actually one of the things that makes me completely disinterested in working in a corporate environment again, and one of the impetus behind me working from home. Okay, so Denise is now never going to work in a corporate environment again uh, because of that situation, and you're not the only person uh, that has been through that. My, I won't say who, um, someone I know, uh, worked in a corporate environment, and um, he, his role and his level of importance was dictated by the size of his office, by how many tiles were in the roof in his office, as well as how close his parking space was to the building. 
what do you think that says to the rest of the people in the organisation and the kinds of values that that organisation has? I know of a company who, um, who was making loads and loads of staff cuts and redundancies and things to the point where they didn't have fresh flowers in reception, they had fake flowers in reception in fake water. I didn't even know that was possible, that you can have fake water. So it's those things, it's those messages that these companies send us that can drive us away. And if we have a, a boss that cherishes what we do, understands us, knows how to motivate us, because we're not all motivated by money. A lot of us are motivated by how many tiles are in our office space or how close our car space is to the building. That's true. Or it might be that people are motiv motivated by um, having access to management. So having a say over how things are run or having uh, training courses or being able to go to awesome events like this or being given Tim Tams or something or other. Everyone's motivated by different things. Um, they might want flexibility. And so if we have this element of, of fairness and happiness in an organisation, there are proven business metrics. Now, I might just see, actually, if I do have this. I have a um, slide that I put in almost every single uh, presentation because I can almost feel the questions being asked. So, imagine... Today's Thursday? Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I flew in the other day. I didn't know what day it was. Um, so imagine going back into the office on Monday, right? And your boss says, so how was the conference? And you, can, you go, it was awesome. I got Tim Tams or I didn't or it sucked or um, something or other. And the boss says, okay, did you learn anything? And you go, yes. What did you learn? I learned that happiness is important. Right. And so, I have this awesome slide, because all sorts of wonderful things happen when we're happy. Our profitability goes up, user ratings go up, turnover goes down, shrinkage, okay, that means theft, okay, um, goes down, absenteeism goes down, the odds of success goes up by 400% when you have happiness as part of the agenda. So please, if you're going to take anything away, let it be Tim Tams and this slide that you can show to management to say that happiness matters. It's not just some airy-fairy thing. Even though I call myself a workplace happiness guru, I can call myself whatever I like <laughs> because I have this ability to be able to go out and speak to people and spruik the importance of having happy people because we know how shitty and demoralising and just soul-destroying it can be when we don't have a culture that nourishes what it is that we do. And as I mentioned in the beginning, what legacy are we leaving our kids, the next generation, if we put up with crappy workplaces? It's up to us to do something about it, and I'm absolutely thrilled that you guys have been here today. Thank you kindly for your time. I will give you an early mark if you like, or I'm here to take questions as well if you like. Thank you kindly.